Hey, welcome back to the channel. Uh, it's been a little while since I posted a video. I got a little bit busy doing other stuff, uh, schoolwork and whatnot, and I didn't realize it's been close to a month since my last video. Um, so I would like to take more time on this video, but I, I'm kind of feeling pressed for time and I need to get something out. So um, today we're gonna do a little camera comparison uh, between two uh, cinema cameras that are all the rage these days, and uh, one of them is this guy. And the other one is this one. Which one is better? Stay tuned to find out. I'm just kidding. Um, today we're gonna take a look at the Blackmagic uh, Design Ursa Mini Pro. Uh, this is a camera that's, uh, so this came out in 2017. It's an iteration or an update on the um, Ursa Mini 4.6K, which I think was 2016. And the original Ursa Mini, uh, 2015, I believe. So uh, this one is, a 4.6K sensor, 4.6K resolution, a super 35 millimeter sensor size, and uh, 4.6K is kind of an odd, uh, maybe odd, odd number uh, you might be thinking. Uh, that means uh, 4,608 by 2,592, but it's a 16 by nine aspect ratio. So if you wanted to use the 4.6K and then export uh, in something smaller like UHD, or 1080p, it's the same aspect ratio as those, and so you won't be losing anything on the edges of your image. Additionally, so the Pro, this guy, is 5,995 bucks, and the 4.6K is $1,000 less. I believe that everything, the, the, the processor and the sensor, um, so that everything, the image quality should be the same between both cameras. They might have improved some of the IR sensitivity um, in the Pro. I'm not exactly 100% sure if all that's ever been kind of identified. But what they did do, that you can see on the Pro, is add all sorts of buttons, dials, switches, and uh, neutral density filters built in um, to the camera. So you can decide for yourself whether all that stuff is worth the extra one grand. 1,000 bucks over the original 4.6K. Additionally, you'll see that I've got some stuff on here. I've got a top handle, I've got the EVF, I've got the shoulder pad um, or the shoulder mount that actually has um, a couple of rosette uh, mounting points here and it's got uh, two 15 millimeter rod adapter holes. Um, and those are all additional items that don't come with the camera body, uh, which is 5,995. And it also does not come with a, a battery. And furthermore, it doesn't even come with the battery plate. Uh, so this part right here on the back is an extra. And um, the reason they do that, I guess, is you can get two different types of plates for the Ursa Mini Pro. Or all the Ursa Minis, actually. You can get a V-Lock, which is this one. Uh, you can see it's a V-shape or you can get the gold mount. The battery plates themselves, especially the V-Lock ones, you know, aren't terribly expensive. Um, I think they start at about 70 bucks. So yeah, just uh, blah, 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 blah. Additionally, I'll talk about, um, but basically all the features of the camera, uh, why it's a good camera, and in what situations you would like, you might want to use it, and also in situations that you might not want to use it, and also a couple of the um, not necessarily glaring flaws, but some of the, definitely some of the flaws. Let's just get those flaws out of the way right off the bat. So the big one, I think for a lot of people, is um, fixed pattern noise. And uh, you you might hear a lot of people talking about whether Blackmagic had ironed out the fixed pattern noise in the Pro. Um, no, they haven't, because this camera exhibits some pretty... Um, glaring <laughs> fixed pattern noise in certain situations. Uh, some people will say that it's just uh, certain camera, um, certain individual units might have more or less fixed pattern noise. And if you, you know, you get a good one or you get a bad one, I don't know if that's true. So there is fixed pattern noise. And um, I'll talk about like when it's most prevalent and how you can get around it. Um, but, but that also ties into another um, thing that you also often hear people say is this is not a low light camera. Um, and what they mean by that is that it can't boost the signal in order to, um, to, to, to mitigate like crappy light lighting situations. So I obviously did a review of the, of the Sony a7S II, which is the low light king. 
And yeah, that camera can boost um, the light sensitivity of the sensor artificially, and you can use the camera in situations that you won't be able to use this camera or a lot of other cameras. You can't do that with this camera. The maximum ISO on the, um, on the Ursa Mini Pro is 1600, and I wouldn't even use that in a low light situation. The fixed pattern noise becomes really bad, um, so it's like, it's not for shooting in low light. If you need the camera to boost up uh, the, the light, you know, you can't, this is not the camera that you, that you need to use. Um, there's no getting around that. It's a camera for controlled situations, <clears throat> uh, a studio camera, a film camera where you have lights, uh, where you're going to control the lighting situation, or in any, you know, well-lit scene where you might not have control, like outside, you know, you can obviously use it in bright daylight, or I mean, you know, reasonable daylight, uh, you know, indoors where there's a lot of light, you can totally use it. Um, but anytime you need to boost up the light with the sensor, um, with the gain, you can't, you can't, just, you can't. I don't know, there's no getting around that. In that situation, the C200 and the Evil One would definitely be better options for you if that's what you need. Another uh, image quality issue is Moray. I've only noticed Moray in one particular instance, um, and I'll show you that. Uh, it was shooting a, a character with a pinstripe suit. Um, it was like a white suit with a light blue pinstripe, and there was a lot of moray on that suit. But there's other situations where you might expect to see it in other sort of patterns. You don't see it. That's really the only time I've ever um, I've ever seen it pop up. Well, I know that the C200 especially has some moray issues in certain situations. I'm not terribly sure about the Evil One. But I think that anything aside from maybe an Ari or a Red is going to have some moray in certain situations. Another weird uh, visual artifact that I have noticed is... Uh, if you use a lot of uh, heavy neutral density, say four to six stops, and you have a wide open aperture, I noticed in one scene that there was like a vertical, like a dark shadow almost um, along the edge of the frame. And I believe it was in that situation with a wide open aperture and a lot of neutral density that was there. I don't know what it was. I don't know what causes it. But anyway, so that's another thing to be aware of. I already talked about how this is... You don't get all this stuff. So I'm gonna take the camera apart and show you kind of what it looks like when you get it and then how you can add to it. And why I like this camera, uh, despite some of those negatives, why I think that <clears throat> if you are in the market for a six to $8,000 cinema camera, I think this is a good option. And I don't know, necessarily know that it's, a, it's better. It's not better in all situations, but I think what you do get with this camera, um, it does offer a lot of really, really compelling features that the C200 and the Evil One don't. So let's go ahead and talk about that. So what are the super compelling features that this camera offers that those don't? And it really boils down to codecs. And what, oh, I took the battery off. So what uh, Canon does, or what they did with the C200 is they offer you know, the same sensor as they offer in the C300 Mark II, and um, they give you the they give you RAW on the high end, uh, which the C300 Mark II doesn't offer um, outside of ex an external recorder. Um, but unless you're shooting in uh, RAW, you're limited to an 8-bit 420 codec, which, you know, like I've talked about in the past, if you're shooting for the web, you know, that's perfectly adequate that's fine. Uh, it's not really going to be an issue, but when you're spending $8,000 plus on a camera, you know, it's, it is kind of a, it's, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for people um, to be handicapped in that way. But it makes sense for Canon because obviously they would, there would be no reason really to get the C300 Mark II, you know, over the C200 anymore if they offered, you know, 10 and 12 bit uh, codecs on it. And, you know, the raw, you might say, well, just shoot in raw, but there's, it's not always feasible. It's, it's a it's a it's a workflow conundrum how to how to make all that uh, work uh, reasonably. Um, so yeah, getting back to this camera. So what is awesome about it, and what's awesome about all the Blackmagic cameras so far or thus far, has been that you can shoot the the codecs are ProRes. Um, and what's great about ProRes is that they work really well in your editing suites, uh, whether that's Final Cut Pro which it's designed for specifically, but even in, in Premiere Pro, if you've worked with exclusively with H2, uh, H.264, 
uh, codecs like on Sony and Canon cameras, uh, and you go and you're editing in uh, with those file formats, it's slow. Uh, even if you've got a, a beastly computer uh, with lots of RAM, good processor, it's still going to be slow. It just has to do with, you know, how, I don't know, I'm not an engineer, but ProRes, on the other hand, it's, it doesn't, uh, the compression somehow is, is just, it's easier for the computer to work with. So while you are, and I'm not talking about rendering speed, I'm talking about working on the edit, on your timeline, in real time. Um, you won't drop frames anywhere near as badly as you do on an H.264 codec. Um, even if you're doing 4K, um, even if you're in like the highest bitrate versions of uh, ProRes, it just, it's way easier um, to edit. Uh, it's just a lot smoother. Uh, the downside to ProRes is they are, they can be really huge file sizes. So you can uh, record in uh, proxy ProRes Lite or ProRes LT uh, 422, uh, ProRes HQ, ProRes 444, and ProRes XQ. So basically everything like HQ444 and XQ are going to be gigantic um, file sizes. The bit rates are huge. Um, uh, I'll maybe show you uh, the white paper that Apple releases on ProRes, and they show the data rates or the bit rates. They only show them for 1080p, and they're massive. So I can only imagine what they would be like in 4K and 4.6K. Um, you're going to get huge files. Um, but if you shoot in, in light, or ProRes LT, the file sizes aren't really much bigger than you might get in, you know, maybe 50 megabits per second. Um, so it's comparable to what you'll get at 1080p on uh, the C200 or the Evo One. Um, in addition to ProRes, they also offer um, DNX HR, which is like basically like a competing version. Um, it's designed to be used with like Avid, which isn't really common like in the YouTube space, but I think it's still pretty common in like professional scenarios in Hollywood and in post-production houses. So it, yeah, but it's similar to ProRes, uh, but it's basically designed for Avid. So I've never used it. I don't know Avid. In addition to that, so you get the, I think, you know, you get the most usable codec and you also, they're also 10 and 12 bit codecs. Even the LT is a 422 codec. Even the proxy is a 422 codec. So everything on this camera is 422 or greater. XQ is 4444. Four, four. Uh, so it's great for people who are doing special effects work, green screening, and, and all that stuff where they need the most precise color data in order to do all that chroma keying and blah, blah, blah. But you don't necessarily need that for any any normal shooting situation. ProRes 422 and, and HQ are perfectly adequate. In addition to the uh, compressed codecs, you also get RAW. Uh, you can shoot in RAW lossless, RAW 3 to 1, and RAW 4 to 1. And all of those are going to be huge file sizes um, in addition to the added workflow um, conundrum or problems of, of dealing with RAW, how you do the color grading and how you do the editing. That's just something that you have to figure out, but it's there. And, you know, Canon offers that with a C200, but they don't offer anything really uh, adequate below that, whereas this camera offers you um, ProRes below RAW. So you don't have to shoot in RAW in order to get the maximum quality out of the camera or out of the sensor. Another really cool thing about it is that you have all of these different formats that you can just pick directly, uh, resolutions and... Um, and aspect ratios you can pick directly from the camera uh, menu system, and depending on uh, the, uh, the, the depending on your resolution, you have uh, different frame rate options. So in any variety of 4K, your maximum maximum frame rate is going to be 60 frames per second, and then in 2K or 1080p, you can shoot up to 120 frames per second. And another really cool thing is that in say for instance the Canon. Um, and I also think the Evil One, when you're shooting in high frame rates, um, you're automatically limited to an 8-bit 420 codec, whereas in this, you can shoot 120 frames per second raw or, you know, any variety of ProRes that you want. So you're not, you know, you still get your 422 and 444 color in your high frame rates. Another really good feature about this is that it's really easy to swap frame rates. Anyway, there's a lot of different options. So you can, sh you can choose your off-speed uh, recording uh, frame rate. So your say your main project you want it to be in 24 frames, and then if you want to shoot in high frame, uh, uh, a higher frame rate, you can set it to 60 or 48 or uh, whatever you want, 120. And then with just a flip of a button right here, uh, HFR, you can be in that high frame rate. 
so you don't have to dive back into the menus in order to switch frame rates. In terms of the build quality, it's a really solid camera. It's made of a magnesium alloy or something, um, so it feels really sturdy, it's pretty hefty. Um, it's got a big fan right on the bottom, blows air right up through the camera. So it's got open ventilation, so I wouldn't definitely use it in the rain. Um, I definitely wouldn't use it in the rain. But um, it feels to me almost like, and this is, I think, a common amongst all the Blackmagic cameras thus far. They're really new in, you know, in manufacturing and designing cameras. It feels almost like a prototype uh, in something that hasn't really been refined to the degree of a Canon, for instance. This example, you can see um, one of the volume uh, or level knobs here for your um, audio fell off. You know, you can still turn it here, but I mean, I guess that could happen to any camera. It's not, I don't know, this is really subjected to a whole lot of crazy wear and tear or abusive handling. It just doesn't feel like, I don't know, I mean, it feels solid, but it also feels like, like even like these switches in here, um, they feel, it feels old school somehow. And, you know, another thing is you'll notice that your, um, your media is exposed as well, you know, unless you have this closed. Um, so it's exposed, to, you know, Canon, they'll have like a little, um, a door that flips up and down to protect the media. A really cool thing about this camera while I'm talking about media is that you've got, uh, CFast 2.0. Uh, so you've got two, two, uh, CFast 2.0 card slots, and you've also got two SD cards. So if you, you can shoot, um, a lot of different ways in SD on an SD card on this camera, uh, 1080p, 2K, um, even in 4K UHD at lower frame rates, you could shoot um, on an SD card. So you don't have to spend a lot of money on CFast 2.0 um, in order to utilize the camera. You can't use you can't use the SD cards as like a proxy backup uh, for a CFast 2.0. That's one or the other. But uh, just to talk about CFast real quick, um, so CFast 2.0 cards. Um, are still really expensive. I don't know when or if ever they're going to come down in price. They're basically, they're really small uh, SSDs. They really have close to the same capacity in terms of reads and write speeds as an SSD, uh, computer hard drives, um, but they're really small, so I'm sure that they're expensive to manufacture. Um, but even that, even though a couple different camera um, companies are using them, Ari uses them in Canon and Blackmagic, they're still expensive. So. Um, there's a recommended list of SS uh, of CFast cars that work with the camera, and they're all they're they're extremely expensive. So, this is a Delkin uh, CFast card, and it's not on the recommended list. Um, it'll work with the camera, but um, you can't shoot in 4.6K uh, raw lossless. It just won't. Um, it'll it'll drop frames, and you can shoot in three to one um, for a bit. And then it'll drop frames, and you can shoot in four to one. But basically, anything um, ProRes you can shoot uh, with no problems. CFast is, is expensive, so it's good that you don't necessarily have to use them, and you can get some cheaper ones. But you won't have access to all of the recording. You won't have access to everything that the camera can do. Another thing to mention real quick is that you can record at 4.6K and 60 frames per second, but you need two CFast cards. So it's basically like writing to one frame to one card and then the, uh, the next frame to the next card. It's kind of like a RAID 0 um, setup. So yeah, if you want to do that, you're going to need two. And another uh, thing to talk about in terms of recording media, and um, you may have seen this, there's been a couple of like kind of jury-rigged uh, ways to record to SSDs. Um, Blackmagic actually re uh, released its own um, SSD adapter. So it, it basically is like a little box that uh, hooks right into the V-lock plate or the gold mount plate and then you put the battery on the back and you can drop an SSD in there. Um, the problem with Blackmagic is that it's only one SSD so you can't do 4.6k 60 frames per second and it also takes up your SDI in and out here so you wouldn't be able to utilize an external monitor or something like that while using the Blackmagic SSD adapter. Um, there are two other ones um, by third-party manufacturers. I'll provide a link in the description to a guy who did a YouTube video comparing the three main ones that are available, uh, Mr. Cheesy Cam. Uh, and there's a really good one, uh, or it seems like a really good option. It actually has, uh, you can record to two SSDs, so you can do 60 frames in 4.6K, and it doesn't take up your SDI in and out. 
um, and it's 500 bucks, which could seem seems expensive, but when you consider the fact that one recommended CFast 2.0 card at 256 gigs costs 500 bucks, <laughs> it might be worth it for that one-time expense, and then you can just buy, you know, you can just buy SSDs, uh, which are way cheaper. Um, maybe you have a couple extras lying around like I do. Um, but yeah. So I will uh, take apart the camera and blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> All right, hey, what's up? What's up, what's up? I don't know what I'm doing. All right, so this is what the camera looks like when you actually get it initially. In the box, you get a side handle and the camera. Um, you don't get the, the plate, like I mentioned. I'm not going to take it off because it's kind of a process. Um, but really, that's it. Uh, so in order to make the camera functional, you need to get the plate and you need to get a battery. Obviously, you need a lens and you need the recording media. So it doesn't necessarily come uh, ready to go like maybe a C200 or C3 or uh, the EVA 1 does. Uh, but once again, the starting price is lower. So I think that once you get everything up and running, you're still in the ballpark. A good thing too, in my opinion, is with um, V-Lock batteries or uh, gold mount batteries, you there's a ton of options. Uh, you're not stuck with buying uh, Canon. Their batteries are really, I mean, there is the same price or more, uh, depending on the capacity as, as you would spend on one of these. You know, they're smaller, which is nice, but the good thing about, this, about a V-Lock and a gold mount is that they come with, um, typically, depending on which kind you get, you've got a USB out, um, or USB in and a, and a D-tap, so you can power other um, pieces of gear uh, with a battery. So if you've got a, an external monitor or an external recorder, um, you don't have to have, you, don't, you know, you're gonna mount that to your camera and then you're gonna uh, put a couple of batteries on it. It's gonna add weight. You don't have to do that with this, so you can just actually power everything on your camera through one battery. So that's cool thing about uh, the way Blackmagic does it, in my opinion. It also comes with a power adapter for plugging it into an outlet. Um, but as you may have heard in other videos, it actually doesn't come with the part that plugs into the wall and then into the brick. So you've got to get that in additionally. <laughs> it's like if you guys have a, a, a desktop PC, basically the, the cord that plugs into your power supply and into the wall, that's what you need. Um, I don't know what that's called. Also, it comes with a LAN C cable to plug um, the handle into the camera so that you can uh, utilize the functions on the handle. Another cool thing about the Pro and that I didn't mention before is that it has an interchangeable mount. So you can buy it in PL mount or EF mount. I've got the EF one. Um, you can buy a PL uh, mount directly from Blackmagic. Uh, you can buy a Nikon mount and you can buy a B4 mount and just change it and have access to a whole other world of lenses um, without adapters. In terms of weight and ergonomics, uh, it's a big, bulky, boxy camera. It's only mini in comparison to the Ursa. If you've ever seen the Ursa, it's a ridiculously giant brick. Um, it feels like a, a lead weight. It, I think it's about 17 pounds, but it feels like a 30 pound um, dumbbell. Uh, so yeah, this is definitely smaller than that. Um, it's smaller than say like an Ari XT or, or some big camera like that as well, but it's definitely bigger than its competition. It's about five pounds like this, so it's not, I mean, it's not real heavy, but obviously when you add this battery weighs a couple pounds and your lens is gonna weigh a bit, and so it's definitely gonna get um, a little bit tricky uh, in terms of hand holding it. For me, like an, an, an essential piece of gear in terms of just ergonomics is a top handle. So this is the Blackmagic top handle. Uh, there's a bunch of different, you know, third-party ones uh, that are available as well. Um, I think that actually hand-holding it with a top handle is is more comfortable uh, and more flexible than using the side grip. So here we go. Everything is um, mounted to the camera minus the long LAN C cable that connects to the handle, um, which is around here somewhere. But uh, so this is a, another really compelling feature or selling point of this camera versus um, its competition is the ability um, to rig it up like this. Um, I really like being able to have the camera up on my shoulder. 
and look through the EVF. You know, you get the handheld look, but it's um, a really stable handheld. It's not jittery. Um, it takes all the pressure off your neck and shoulders. Uh, even a C200 or an EVA 1, I would imagine, holding it up DSLR style. And on the C200, utilizing that EVF on the back, it's really great that it's built into the camera. It's great that Canon offers it and their EVFs are good, but just holding it up the way you have to do, it's tiring. Uh, even on those light body uh, cameras, um, it, it really, it, it, there's a lot of strain involved in that and you might not believe me, but try it out sometime. There are some issues with it. It's not completely 100% worked out. Um, issues are, uh, I think that the grip, um, the extension arm is probably not as long as it needs to be. Uh, you can, the good thing about it is that it's an RE um, um, mount, so you can add another extension arm onto it if you want to. It'll, maybe you have this one at a uh, more acute angle and then you have the other one jutting out. Um, so, I mean, there, there are options. Uh, obviously, you can change the angle of this um, and then you can also uh, adjust the angle of the grip. Uh, to take uh, strain off your wrist. I wouldn't want it like this how it is right now, but uh, I just put it up real quick uh, to get it uh, to demonstrate it. Another thing is in order to get the camera balanced is a little tricky. Uh, you don't have enough. So you can slide along. Uh, you've got about two inches to slide this um, the camera along the, the the shoulder adapter or the the shoulder plate. And additionally, you can actually move the whole thing forward and back. You've got four mounting holes on the bottom that you can utilize. It would be nice if you if it were if there was like a mechanism where you could just unlock it and then slide it while it's on your shoulder in order to get the balance right. Um, as it is, you basically have to un, you know, take it off, make an adjustment, put it back on, uh, and see how it feels. You know, even if it's not 100% balanced uh, on the center of gravity, you know, it still is less straining, I think, obviously, than using um, a camera that you're holding up directly to your face. Conclusion. Um, so Blackmagic cameras, um, I've talked about them before. I talked about the BIMC, and now I've talked about the Ursa Mini Pro. I really like what Blackmagic is doing. I'm super happy that they're in the market uh, because they're really pushing the boundaries about what to make available to consumers at certain price points. Um, obviously, with the price points of their cameras, there are going to be some drawbacks quality issues, some sensor quirks, and but the good thing about them is they're, they're, they're always doing, well, not always, but every quarterly at least, usually it seems like there's firmware updates, so they're trying to fix known issues, um, they're looking for customer feedback, and um, their customer service seems to be good, you know, if you go on forums or look at YouTube, people send their cameras back because they've got problems, and they get a new one. And, you know, like I said, they're giving you everything they can give you. They're not holding back. Um, and they're giving it to you at a really low price point. Um, and they're giving you, you know, ProRes and, uh, and RAW. And no one else is doing that except for, you know, the big, the big dogs like Red and Ari. And, you know, you're going to spend so much more money on those than you will with Blackmagic cameras. You know, most people don't know what cameras are out there. They don't know RED, they don't know ARRI, they don't know Blackmagic, they don't really care. They just want the results. Uh, yeah. This is a um, very low-key and rambling uh, end to the video. So, thanks for watching and see you next time. Hey, one more thing. Um, one more essential piece of um, equipment is if you get the um, shoulder mount, uh, you'll have an issue when you want to mount it to um, a tripod, for instance, or anything, a slider or a dolly or a tripod. You have to um, take off the shoulder mount and then mount your quick release plate to the bottom of the camera. Or, uh, as you can see on the bottom here, you've got this, um, there's a little mechanism, mounting mechanism, which fits a uh, VCT14 adapter or plate or whatever you want to call it. So this is how it works. It basically just locks in. It's easier to do when it's on a tripod. Is it backwards? No. <laughs> is it? It was locked. I'm an idiot. 
All right, so it just locks in there and it's really in there good. So then you have your quick release plate already uh, mounted to the bottom of the VCT-14 and then you can just drop it onto your tripod. And then if you want to handhold again, you just unlatch it so this stays on the tripod and then you have the camera. So it saves uh, a lot of time and it makes the whole process a lot easier. Um, but once again, it's an added item that can be pretty expensive. Uh, the, like I said, the U14s are, are cheaper. They don't uh, always have this back little notch that locks into the back, the back here. Um, it just holds it very securely. Uh, the U14s are plastic, um, and this, these are all metal construction, uh, so they're just higher quality and therefore more expensive. So you have some options. Um, I would definitely recommend if you have the shoulder kit. Um, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, um, to get to get one to go along with it. It just makes your life a lot easier. Uh, yeah. Sorry, gun jokes aren't funny right now. And they never were, motherfuckers.